Welcome to Movie House Cinemas. Popcorn? Yes, please. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the movie. Reclining chairs? Don't mind if I do. Action, thriller, romance, we got it all. Discover the cinema today. Movie House Cinemas, home of the movies. Good evening, good evening, and welcome along to Robin Elliott tonight. It's good to have your company with us once again. So coming up on the show this evening, I'll be chatting to comedians Catherine Ryan and Marcus Keeley. The movie maestro Tim Burden is going to be here with all the latest movie releases. We'll be chatting to local history author Aidan Campbell, and we've got live music in the studio from singer-songwriter Ben Cutler. Okay, but starting off the show, as always, we're going to take a look at some of the big talking points that uh, the nation are talking about this week. To help me do it, I'm pleased to say that the very lovely Jenny the Doc has joined us. Thank you in so the much studio. for having How are you? I am wonderful. It's so good to see you. It's and, amazing to see you. And may I say how here. stunning you're looking okay. tonight. I may as well not be Thank here. You. Evening gown. Thank you so much. Well, and everything, everything. Well, since you're dressed, would you like to join me for a little night out on the town? Tonight? Oh, well, this oh, sure, is that'd be lovely. Where do you want to go? Fabulous. There's a little award ceremony happening Every time. Oh, at, wow. at the Europa. Let's go. Let's, let's go. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Let's get a cheeky drink first. Let's go cheeky drink. Um, but before that, we've got to do the talking points. Which oh, is, hi, which oh, is hi, Robin. You're here, Mr. Yeah. Showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> Am I here? Do I even exist? Uh, well, hi. Hi, and, Great your, to see and you. your name is Jenny. Uh, I do, we do have some crazy stories for you, although I don't know if we can outdo that, Robin, to be honest. Thank you very much. Just lost my girlfriend live, live at the Robin Elliott show. Never. 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 Anyway, talking about angry people, we're talking about an angry lady first, aren't we? Well, love is tiff. There's nearly going to be one here after that. Thank <laughs> you very much. Um, I'll read you the headline. This is fantastic. Uh, angry. Uh, girl angry at her boyfriend clouds 80 feet power power line okay 80 feet power line and it goes off from there jenny over to you okay so she was mad at her boyfriend so instead of blocking him or just you know not answering the phone go into the, go into the other she room and call off. to climb an 80 foot high power tension uh power line right. and he being the idiot that he has decided to follow her it, up it was one of these ones so here it? they are up 80 feet with high power having a standoff it's having a standoff stand Police had to get involved to negotiate them down. They finally got down and did not get arrested because they got a good telling off from the police instead. Can you, uh, we've, all been, <laughs> we've all been there, haven't we? When it's like, well, if you think, you're, you know, you walk out the house, right, I'm going to take five minutes here. You storm out of the house yeah. and then you, you know, well, you think you could do that. I'm going off to the pub for an hour. Exactly, so you, yes. These two scales an 80-foot power line. One of these ones is like about 20 wires going across it. You know? Yeah, like the big high tension power um, line like this. Not Honestly, like a simple telephone These wire. people are crazy. These yes. people are crazy. They, get, they did get them back down. Can you imagine how... And they have to be Americans, weren't they? Well, well... They were not Americans. <laughs> oh. In India. Thank you very much. Right, um, it's okay. There you go. They're not... Uh, that's a rarity, Jenny. The mad one not in America. It is a mad one uh, not in America. Uh, <laughs> we're moving on to uh, We're going to move... We've got to... This is brilliant, actually. Fair play to this guy. 97-year-old granddad sets record as the world's oldest motorcycle racer. And that... That is the start of it. Wait. He raced against his son, age 64, <laughs> and his granddaughter, age 21. And guess who beat them both? He did. He came in fourth place, the son came in in 21st place, and the granddaughter came in 30th place. He's about 80 oh. years younger. And <laughs> he missed the race last year because he fell off his motorbike breaking six ribs. Before it even started. Before it even started. Uh, so he, get, wow. he gets back. But he came back. Think about and that. And at 97 years old, came in fourth place in a motorcycle race. I want to get him on the show. No, get him on, get him on the show. He's in New Zealand. We can find it's, him. It's okay. Yeah. Robert's got a very big budget. He'll have it flown <laughs> over. He'll have it flown over by next Monday. And the great thing is, after COVID and everything, he couldn't race for three years. And then he finally got back last year and got up on got up onto the thing to start the whole thing. Of fell off his bike, broke his ribs. The year before COVID, he missed the race too because he had a hip replacement surgery. Of course, he had a hip replacement. There you go, 97 years old. I'm fighting strong. That'll be me in about two years' time when I turn 97. I've aged very well. Right. Robin's Botox. One final story. What have we got? This one's for the surgeon, really. This is absolutely fantastic. The new vitamin is AirPods, isn't it? Eating vitamins. We'll say vitamins in America, but sure. Of course, there you go. Jenny, take this one away. You've got this is the surgeon. A Utah woman in her 30s. America, go, Robin, of course. She's on the phone. She's distracted, talking to her friend while going for a little walk in Utah on a nice Saturday morning. She has her vitamins with, with her to take them as she walks with her big, nice water bottle. She thought the vitamins were all clumped together and felt funny, popped it in her mouth, swallowed them, then realized a second later it's her husband, AirPods. 
She swallowed her husband's AirPod instead of taking her vitamins. Took her vitamins too. Don't worry. She got her supplements. This was, tra this was trending she on TikTok, right? But she went to TikTok to try and get the answer. Not, 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 not A&E. <laughs> no, no. &E. she, she filmed a TikTok about it and then took advice from her medical friends and relatives. Now, the question that I want to ask is, did they work when they made a reappearance? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the thing. What... You do let them reappear the natural way. The yeah. natural way, so you yes. don't go to surgery. No, you let yeah, them they, they come out of the out. system. Yes. yes. So they drop out. Uh, would now, you use them again? Would you personally use them again? I wouldn't. But I would <laughs> What's the class? I would potentially sell them, you? clean them, and sell them any bed. <laughs> let me ask you a question um, before we before you thunder <laughs> off and you run off with Robert for the night. Um, what, what's the weirdest thing that you've ever had to? What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen anybody swallow or okay, have in a well, weird place? In pediatrics, I've taken out. Thousands of coins from children's esophagus. It's coins. Okay. Kids eat coins. Yeah. They get stuck in the esophagus. American about kids, all the time. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids I actually had one little boy tell me, I said, he was a little bit older, he was six or seven, so I asked him, hey, what happened? He said, oh, you know, I was really hungry and the fridge was too far away. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the best quote of my entire career, actually. The fridge was just too far away. Have you, I'm sure you could relate to that. You know, well, why are you trying to say? Away. You know, uh, anyone going, can. Oh, I think I'll just, just eat a handful of coins. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you telling me something about a hamster once, I'm just saying. Yeah, there's a, that was when I was in training, working in an adult hospital, which is one of the reasons why I don't work with adults, only pediatrics. A hamster went somewhere funny, that's where we leave it. A, hamster, a man put a hamster somewhere funny. That's where we leave yes. it. <laughs> there we go, that's this week's Big Talking Points. <laughs> Now, time for some live music in the studio. And singer-songwriter Ben Cutler has got a new EP coming out. It's called Break the Ice. And here's what happens when we caught up with Ben earlier this week. On the right track before the lightning struck me down. From my head to the ground before I even heard a sound. Just like everyone said, you gotta give things time to grow. And when the moment's right. Roll on through the night Make the sacrifice In your ordinary life You've got to break the ice I was going to ride away before the night took over the day. Aiming for the light, but nothing's black or white, only gray. Just like I've always said, you'll have to survive the flood. And keep an eye over your shoulder, summer only. But you gotta break the ice To roll on through the night Make the sacrifice In your ordinary life You've gotta break
Oh, you gotta break the ice To roll on through the night Make the sacrifice In your ordinary life You've gotta break the ice And we'll have some more music from Ben a little bit later on. Now, still to come, we're talking movies with Tim Burden. And comedian Catherine Ryan joins us right after these. Heading to the North Coast? The Jet Centre in Korean offers entertainment for everyone. There's an eight-screen movie house cinema with all the best movies, 10-pin bowling, a massive arcade, soft play for the wee ones, Outdoors, there's a mini fun park and gem mining, plus an 18 hole floodlit mini golf course. Rain or shine, there's something for everyone here at the Jet Centre. Find out more at thejetcentre.co.uk. And welcome back to Robin Elliott tonight. We're talking food now, which is always good. One of my favourite subjects on the show. And this evening we're learning how TV and film can inspire our culinary creations and tasty treats. To talk more about this, we're joined by comedian Catherine Ryan. Catherine, how are you today? I'm very well, Robin. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, like you say, I am a huge fan of the joy, the wonderful, very simple indulgence of cooking at home. And a new study shows that 30% of Brits want to make what they see on TV, and why not? Now, they've come up with the uh, top 50 most iconic food moments from a TV and film, and Friends has come out on top, hasn't it? I think we've all watched a lot of Friends. Yeah, and they've had some food mishaps. There was a time that Rachel made a very sweet trifle with a savory layer. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, uh, the meat trifle. Thankfully, we're not recreating that, but um, there's a New Yorker meatball marinara sub that I haven't tried yet, actually, but it just looks out of this world. And of course, there's big banquets in Bridgerton. You've got uh, the roast duck with uh, the potatoes, another fabulous food combination. I did try that one, actually. We were doing some photos the other day and it really felt fancy, you know. I got a lovely dress on and there were beautiful flowers on the table. You know, treat yourself at home. Red wine, um, we had some champagne and it is this really, really moist, flavorful duck with Duchess potatoes. I loved it. Now, what about your kids? Do they get any say on uh, what goes on in the kitchen? Well, my son is two years old and a tyrant and he will only eat pasta at the minute. He tries to have pasta for breakfast. Right now, he's got us down to pasta for lunch and dinner. You know, with kids, it is lucky though. I'd prefer him eating pasta to nuggets or something because we can sneak a lot of edge into the different sauces. He yeah. will do different shapes. I've spoken to moms whose sons, and I don't know why it's always the sons, but they won't even entertain a different pasta shape. So he'll do any shape and he'll do any sauce. So what he doesn't know is that sometimes there's going to be spinach and chicken and pesto in that sauce. And sometimes it's going to be a bolognese. And, you know, we, we get creative even with pasta. So has he watched the Lady and the Tramp movie then? Oh, you know, he hasn't. He has watched Matilda. And, right. of course, that evokes that big chocolate cake that Miss Trunchbull makes the, the little boy eat. And uh, also Beauty and the Beast, where there's loads of food and all the utensils are dancing around. But he hasn't seen Lady and the Tramp yet. I feel like all the movies that we grew up on are a little bit, a little bit sad for the utopian world of, you know, Peppa Pig. They're, they're not used to anything bad happening. I don't think a dog catcher, he's not ready for a dog catcher. No. Well, I was thinking if he likes pasta, then he'll like the spaghetti scene in that movie. But it's also very close to home. Well, he, yeah, he would love that scene <laughs> alone. He probably feels a lot like Lady because he got a new baby sister and probably just feels, maybe he would find a kinship with that. That writing. 
Tell us about the uh, Dinner Show Hub then. What's that all about? Well, this is Gusto's new initiative. So it's all these flavorful, wonderful recipes. And you can go online to gusto.co.uk and you can find the 50 hottest recipes, but also so much more from Gusto to make all by yourself at home. It's so easy and it just beats beats anything. We don't order takeaway anymore and we hardly go to restaurants. That is a time issue also, but it's it's got everything we want. Now, I'm not that good in the kitchen, but if these recipes really are that easy, then I'll have to give it a go. You know, they have even 10-minute meals on there. Uh, these recipes, I think most of the ones that I've seen are kind of between 20 and 40 minutes. I don't know that. Like, from memory, it's about that. And uh, they really come out so, so much better than you would ever imagine that you could cook. It's given my husband so much confidence in the kitchen because he's learned even what things go together. So even when he's making his own meal, he's learned about, oh, you know what? All I need is some lemongrass, some ginger, some garlic, some soy, put some protein on that. Like he's, he's learned loads of cooking hacks and you can see those all online. And it's really affordable, like it starts at $2.99 a portion. Catherine, while we have you on, any exciting TV projects in the pipeline that we should know about? Uh, well, I just traveled all around with my good friend, comedian Joe Wilkinson, to make something called Bargain Holidays for Channel 4. And I think that'll be coming out in the autumn. And that is, you know, people want to go on holiday and they want to find the best deals. Joe Wilkinson, is a little bit of a jokester. So, I mean, he took me to clean beaches for a free hot dog. Uh, some bargains I don't think are worth it, but some bargains that he showed me, flight deals, hotels, different places to have a meal. Oh, we went to this, oh, we went to an amazing place in, was it Norwich? Because we actually went to Northern Ireland as well. Do you know where we went in Northern Ireland? Forget yeah, that. Right. We stayed in Belfast, in George Best's childhood home. Now that is amazing. I haven't even been there. You can go and it's very affordable. Uh, ugh, I, I'm only guessing now, but I think it was 70 pounds a night or something very affordable to stay there. And it's all preserved. It's like a museum. You push buttons as you go around the house and it's his sister narrating like, yes. here's the kitchen and here's where we would do this and that. And you learn all about his life and there's loads of memorabilia. It's just the perfect place to stay for you know, a stag do weekend or even with your partner or on your own. It's, it was really cool. I slept in his childhood bed and his football wow. kit was on the chair. Well, it's somewhere that I'm really going to have to go and visit uh, when I get a chance. Catherine, it's been great talking to you. Thank you for joining us on the show. And uh, we look forward to seeing bargain holidays as well. Thank you, Robin. See you soon. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, we're staying with comedy. We're going to find out about a brand new show called Bins and Toilets from uh, comedian Marcus Keeley. Before we do that, let's take a look at Marcus in action. Here's a thing that went viral recently, especially with the good people of Lisburn. Lisburn's the city for life, so I thought I would go out and experience some of this firsthand, see what's on offer and be fulfilled. You can go to the Galleria Terminator 2 style, and it was good to see people out and about, you know, you have Elmo here just chilling out, taking it easy. And there's a good ambiance knocking about, you know. Figured I'd have a go on the escalator, seeing as it was running. Once I ticked that off the list, I thought, may as well walk around and see what else there is. And then I remembered here, they've got the toilets. So I'll go down and have a wee look at them. That's your standard sort of steel toilet job here. So if it was good, like, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be back. So... There we go. I don't know what the people of Lisburn thought. I don't know what I think, because obviously I did live in Lisburn for a long time. But uh, Marcus, I mean, that, that clip went viral. And I would imagine you get some stick from the Lisburn people from it. I did. I got, I got some messages from people saying that I should apologise to the people of Lisburn, should apologise to the shopping centre and, and all that. But the main thing I took away from it was that there was a lot of messages from people like yourself who used to live in Lisburn, currently live in Lisburn, people who lived on the other side of the world, yeah. commenting saying, oh, that's a shame because whenever I was really young, that was the place for me and my mates to hang out and so many great memories of it, you know? So it was a sort of a bittersweet type thing yeah. where, yes, there were people sort of in, enjoying it, but also being more mean-spirited than I intended it. Yes. But there was also a great sense of, you know, nostalgia and 
people feeling sad about it. And as well as that, I mean, there's a bit of commentary in there as well, because uh, as we know, lots of the big stores have left Lisburn city centre to go to other places. So sometimes Lisburn is like a ghost town. So we're commenting on what exactly is happening in the city centre at the moment, aren't you? And that's the case for a lot of small towns or sorry, cities. Lisburn, yeah. of course, is a city. A city. Yes, yeah. um, a lot of them look the same yeah. and a lot of the places are being empty and you know far be it for me to say what to do with it but you've you know you've seen the sort of the community coming around it and it's like well perhaps put more use into the city rather than maybe something like commerce yes. to have more sort of community focused stuff in city centres there was the the big tesco in belfast once that the pre-mark fire burned down that's now an arts community yeah. type shared space yeah. area so i think stuff like that's really good what about you? Where are you from? Are you a Lisburn person? Are you a Belfast person? What? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a source of contention. Um, originally Belfast, okay. but then when Lisburn was looking to get city status, it enveloped part yes, of West Belfast. Of course, yes. Once they got it, they secured it. Yes. And then now I'm back in Belfast. So some of my bins do say Lisburn on it because they're old. <laughs> some of them are the, the newer Belfast bins. How many bins do you have? Because we have three and I still to this day can't work out which bin is, is which bin goes out on this day, mm. which bin's for rubbish, which bin's for garden. I can't, I can't work it out. I have, uh, there's your general waste. Yes. Okay. No food goes in that. Okay. Not, nothing like that at all. Just your uh, stuff that can't be recycled. Okay. Then you have your recycling. Yes. Then you have your uh, dirty bin as I call it, where all your food, compost, all that. And also pizza boxes go in there. Okay. You can't put a pizza box in the recycling because that counts as soiled. So it needs to go in the compost bin so for it to, for it to compost. I so there you go. Got, I still haven't got a clue what he's on about. I mean, I put something in the wrong bin one time and they wrapped yellow tape around it and wrote contaminated on it. And my bin wasn't lifted. Oh my God. Yeah. The shame because your neighbours would have seen that as exactly. well. Exactly. My bin was contaminated and they told the, the whole street. Oh my God! Have you, have you considered being a bin influencer? This is this, <laughs> I should, I should, I should. this is a term I've heard. The first person to put out the bin the night before the 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 bin bin day eve, as yes. I like to call it, everyone pays attention to that person. They go recycling then because he put it out. He's always the first one that he's always right. Well, they're going to be confused at the minute because my bin has been out for a week and I haven't brought it back in yet. <laughs> They'll just be constantly bringing it out and hoping that something will happen. Pavlovian response to, to your bin being out in the street. So all this chat about bins, I mean, is bringing us on to your show, which is called Bins and Toilets, isn't it? Yes. Why? I have had a strange fascination with bins right. and, and toilets. Yeah. Um, sort of similar to, as we were talking about, the city centres being um, what is now trendily referred to as a liminal space. Yeah. If you go into a toilet, you know... It's, it's an empty space, it's a functional space. Yes. It's just, but the, you can't do without them, they have to exist. Yeah. And I think there's there's a strange sort of philosophy behind that, where it's just purely functional, but for like a human action, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It just yes. seems like yeah. a, a, a strange thing. And also with bins as well, it's just that the bin will be emptied, but there will always be something to go in the bin. And that's a continual process. Yeah. I'm sounding much deeper than the show is you right are, now. You are, exactly, yes. Um, yeah. But over, over COVID and, um, uh, around that time where you know can't get on stage can't yeah. go out can't see people you know that's what life was very much like it was yeah. just a cycle of putting stuff in the bin the bin comes and it's emptied yeah and that uh, i ended up doing i realized uh, reviewing uh, videos that i've done over the years there is always quite a lot of toilet videos in there bin <laughs> videos not toilet humor no. but just videos that i happen to take when you're in the in the toilet not on the toilet. You can get arrested for that if you're I roaming know. around toilets with your phone in your hand filming. Exactly. You do realise that. I do. I do realise that. Yes, <laughs> but um, you know, art art is worth the risk, in my opinion. I have been recognised in toilets yeah. uh, from doing shows, and it is always that strange conversation where someone is is. Mid -act. And you never want to shake hands because you no. know where their hands have been. <laughs> exactly. And I, I'm, I'm even pre-COVID, I was very germ focused, so very yeah. rarely I, I enjoy shaking hands. Does anyone enjoy shaking a hand? Not so really, no, no. Probably, no, we, no. Could, we could do without it. I, think we, can, just, I think we can do without it, can't I, we? Sometimes I always like just to do like a slight bow <laughs> upon meeting people. <laughs> just like, it's very, very slight. It's just you, you tip the head. Yeah. It's a sign of respect. Okay. And I think that's enough. What about the old fist bump? Seems very trendy, doesn't it? It's just, it's very, you know, I don't know about that. Do you know the high five has only existed for about 30 or 40 years? Really? Yeah. It, was, it, it, it came uh, about in the 70s or the 80s. It's just strange to think that that is now such a, a commonplace thing and it never existed back in the day. Yeah. That's why you never see photo, wartime photos of people high-fiving each other. 
Okay, right, your show, Bins and Toilets. If they want to catch it at the black box, tough. They can't because it's sold out on the 30th, isn't it? It is. It's sold out. Now, this is a, an afternoon gig in the black box. Uh, there's comedy on every afternoon, every Saturday afternoon in the black box. Um, there's all different types of shows. Sometimes there's a solo show like myself. Uh, a lot of the rest of the time, they are uh, sort of variety shows. There's a bigger lineup. And some of them come with um, challenges. So there's one called Stoneface. Right. Uh, where an audience member is selected and they are told they must not laugh at any of the acts. And for every laugh they give away to yeah. an act, they have to then give the act £10. So there's six acts. It's not from their own money, though. It's from, from, the, right. from the kitty. <laughs> I'd say, we'll take it on. That's a good risk, though. It is, bring your it? own yes, money. Yeah. Um, so there's the opportunity there for an audience member to walk away £60 from not laughing. Okay. Um, there's also Coven Comedy Club, which is an all-inclusive LGBTQ lineup uh, that is on once a month, as well as uh, Best of Three, where you get comedians to come up and they have three minutes to do their best stuff, and then the audience vote at the end tells you um, who won, wow. who won that. And there's also Kill Your Darlings, which is for um, acts who are just in the process, sort of like an open mic night, but it's established acts who maybe haven't quite figured it out yes. what they're doing it's sort of newish material and it's seen as a as a as a, a show for them to really find by by trial yeah. whether this stuff is going to work so every every saturday afternoon at the black box um you'll find some comedy going on comedy is something we're doing well here in belfast mm. i mean we've got comedians from here who are filling the sse arena filling the grand opera house for 10 nights at shane todders and stuff i mean we're doing really well aren't we yeah no the 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 scene is got really really big especially again i think because of covid there was no new people coming through people hadn't been on the stage and as soon as that ended and the clubs opened again there was loads of brand new comics coming yeah. in and i had i started doing stand up again sort of last december and i remember going in and going up to the, the clubs and being on the lineup and there's always like a wee comedian's corner up the back of the room and walking up and i'm just looking at them they're all and they're all so young and yeah. and and vital and really really good yeah. and i'm just standing there like one of their dads just being like <laughs> all right I, I used to do comedy do you, do you not know me no so it's been it's been humbling in that since like being back at school yeah all right, Marcus, good to see you. You too. Thank you for coming in. I'll, I'll not shake hands with you. Maybe I'll, I'll try one of your wee... We'll do wee bow. Your wee bows like that, yeah. Thank you for coming in. Right, still to come, we'll be chatting to local history author Aidan Campbell. He'll be with us right after this break. Here we are on the north coast where sporting legends are made. He needs this putt to advance to the next stage, but can he do it? The crowd are holding their breath. Can he cope with the pressure? Dad, would you take the shot? Yes! Yeah. Well. And welcome back to Robin Elliott tonight. So we're talking local history next, and here's what happens when I caught up with local history author Aidan Campbell. Okay, my next guest is a local author and historian who's raised over £150,000 for charities through the sales of his books. Books like this, let's find out more because Aidan Campbell joins us in the studio. Aidan, how are you? Very well. Robin, how are you doing? Very well, thank yeah. you. So thank you for joining us. So we'll talk about uh, your new book and stuff in a second, but tell us a bit about uh, your background to start with, because you weren't always in, into writing books and stuff, were you? No, uh, I worked in business for a number of years as an accountant, then I was in sales and marketing and business consultancy. But uh, about uh, 23 years ago, I became a Marie Curie volunteer, the Marie Curie Hospice on the Knock Road. And uh, way back in those days, then we were putting chairs away after a, an event into the fundraising building, which is an old house on the Knock Road, actually. And there was one of those old Victorian sepia-tinted pictures on the wall. And there was an elderly man, an elderly lady, and a young girl, and they were playing croquet on the front lawn. And of course, when you look out the front door of the fundraising building, it's now a car park. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the conversation was, I wonder who those people were. Yes, yeah. And, you know, they must have been a very wealthy family. 
Uh, and uh, you know, it'd be very nice to know this because Marie Curie will be having its 40th anniversary in 2005, you say. I suppose 60 is coming up shortly. I said, I'll volunteer. Yeah. I'm a volunteer, you say. I'll, I'll volunteer to go away and find out who these people were. So spend a bit of time at the public record office, the Linen Hall Library, the Central Library, Browsing Street Directors, and I got the whole story. So I found out who the people were, a very wealthy family. Uh, there were there's a man called um, uh, McMaster, and he was uh, uh, um, a men's outfitter. Right, and he yeah. built his house in retirement and was with, with his wife and his daughter. And because they were quite a small family, they built a croquet lawn. Well, right, okay. A lot of tennis courts around big houses in those days. Yes, yeah. But anyway, uh, the book sold quite well. And then I was invited out to give talks. And I got a phone call one day and somebody said, we hear you writing this book on, on, on the old house, Beaconsfield it was yeah. called. Will you come to our men's group and give us a talk about it? So I said yes. So then the telephone started to ring. And then a lady came and said, my husband told me you were at their men's group. Would you come to our ladies' group? And then somebody else phoned and said, would you come to our senior citizens' group? And then would you come to our local history society? Right, yeah. So it started to gather up. Yeah. And then people always ask me, have you another book planned? Yeah. So this year I'm at book number 24. Wow. I've given something like 600 talks. Yeah. And I've donated all the profits from the books to charity. And the number's a wee bit higher, 150,000 now. That's the book sales through Hillmount yeah. Garden Centre. Donations to charity are about 183,000 over the last 20 years. Brilliant. And you've received some quite big accolations and, and awards as yes, well, haven't yes, you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's gone well. I, I, I received an award for, from Marie Curie for outstanding contribution. They flew me over to London, actually. And then I was over at Buckingham Palace with my wife a few years ago. I was awarded the British Empire Medal. So it was nice to be over there. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Tell us about the books then. I mean, we're, we're sitting here obviously in Donegal Street in yes, the city centre at yeah. the minute, and I see we got some photographs, yes. St Anne's Cathedral, the old yes. bank buildings. So what, what can you tell us about this area then? Most of my books are about the history of East Belfast, mm -hmm. all the old town lands, like yeah. names of old Bally McCarrot, Knock, or Gildner Herc, or Raven Hill, uh, and places like that. The book on Greater Belfast, how it all emerged was an English publisher contacted me and they'd seen some of my books and they said, would you do a book for us? Mm -hmm. We have a model and what the idea of our model is, a number of cities around the UK, you take an old postcard view from say 100 years ago and then what you could do, you do is you get out with your camera and you take the same photograph today. Yeah. And you stand in the same place the photographer stood and then you merge the two photographs. Yeah. So that's what Belfast Reflections is about. Uh, and so Belfast Reflections, like all my books, available at the Hillmount, uh, Hamilton News at Craigie, Bell's News Agent at King Square, and Jack's Cafe at C.S. Lewis Square yeah. at Conswater. Brilliant. And also some of them online. Uh, in terms of Belfast Reflections, of course, uh, it's quite an historical. I mean, you know, the charter for the town of Belfast goes back to 1613. And we're actually in part of Old Belfast now. So Old Belfast was under around High Street, mm -hmm. but along uh, Donegal Street here as well. And, you know, quite historical. Not too far from here, of course, is St Anne's Cathedral. Yeah. And that's in the book. And on down, of course, the Northern Wing building. Yeah. And across the road is supposed to be the oldest building in Belfast, the Old Belfast Banking Company building. Which is so sad to see that building lying it empty is, at the yeah, minute, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And of course, that was built in about 1770. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, in some ways I have a certain sympathy with builders and people that own these old buildings. These were built with a technology of like 1770. Yeah. So when you bring it right up to date, like, of course, they don't have like a lift for disabled people or a damp proof course and it needs re plumbed and rewired and the rain's coming in. Yeah. And of course, Who's got the money to do all that in these hard times? I know, exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. But I was just looking at it as a pastor, I know what you mean, yeah. So this book, Belfast Reflections, and is this still available? Can people still get their hands on a yeah, copy of that? Yeah, uh, you, you can still get that one online, and you can buy it at any of my retailers as well. Brilliant, uh, okay. Like so there's the obviously books. another book in the pipeline as well. Yes, so what can we look be. forward to then? This is it here. Okay, Shandon. Shandon, yeah. Shandon, yes. And of course, Shandon, like a lot of my books, the title is... The, the town land name 
uh, uh, and because Shandon's not a townland, but the name is an old anglicised Gaelic name, and it comes from Old Gaelic Shan, Old, and Don Fort. So it's literally Old Fort. Right, okay. And so the Old Fort was a Norman fort, now known as an area on Shandon Park called the Shandon Mound. So the Normans were here about a thousand years ago in the area. So, of course, the area is probably best known for Shandon Park Golf Club. Yes. And I discovered recently a cemetery across the road that's always there is locked up the, as well. That the Old Knock Cemetery, into, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are two small hills in the area and Knock Townland. Knock, of course, as Anglo says, Gaelic, that means the hill. Yeah. So the hill at Knock is where the old graveyard is. So there were two hills. Uh, the mound, or the Shandon Moat, which is built a, 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 a Norman castle. And, and quite often near these moats was a church and a graveyard because often the, um, the uh, forts had a town around them. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, people needed to go to church and needed to be graveyards. So, so you're quite right. So quite close to the Shandon Mound is the old Knock graveyard, which goes back, as I said, about a thousand years. Yeah. Supposed to have been visited at one stage by St. Columba. Right, okay. Cause, because as you, you know, uh, if you look at the area, uh, a number of the churches, like St. Columbus is the Church of Iron Church, not too far away. Now, the Roman Catholic Church at Ballyhackamore is St. Colum Kills, which is a Gaelic version of Columba. Yeah. So the name survives. There we go. So when can we get to see the book on Shandon then? Uh, the Shandon book is coming out in October. Okay. And I'll say it'll be available, of course, at Hellmount and the other retailers as well. Great stuff. And well, we look forward to that. Yes. I could talk to you all day, yeah. but we're out of time, sadly. <laughs> so uh, thank okay. you for coming in and the best of luck with the book. Thanks, Robin. Right, still to come, we're talking movies with uh, the movie maestro with Tim Burden. But uh, before that, let's have some more live local music and something good from Ben Cutler now. Back to living in the fast 
sleep running like a freight train I had an airplane stronger than a hurricane Clear to see that I was born to be free When everything seems to be In a pale battle all my enemies are out to get me You better stand in line, I ain't going out easy Okay, Ben, first of all, tell us a brief little bit about your musical journey so far. Yeah, so I started busking in the streets and then I got into the songwriting side of the industry as well um, through playing at the Belfast Nashville Songwriters Festival when I was young. Um, and then progressed to playing some festivals and um, I guess the main change has been now bringing my own music and playing with the band. And recently we've been playing at some fantastic local festivals as well. So a whole new sound for me the last two years going more towards the blues rock full band sound and yeah influenced by the likes of Black Keys and a few more like southern rock artists. Tell us about uh, the new EP that you have uh, coming out what can we expect from that? Yeah so in May there I was in the studio up at Analog Catalog Studios in Newry uh, with a talented producer called Dar Tibbs uh, so five track EP definitely uh, continuing sort of the direction I headed last year with the blues rock sort of vibe to it a um, few heavy tracks and then something a bit more southern rock and then a bit of a chilled one, you know, reminiscent of my, my younger years. <laughs> You're going to have a big uh, EP launch party coming soon as well, aren't you? So EP launch is 20th of October in the Deer's Head in Belfast. We've got some great special guests as well. We have Cal John Suckling, local artist and an up-and-coming band called The Thing Is. Excellent. So tell us about, uh, we heard uh, the song Break the Ice. What's the kind of story behind Break the Ice then? Yeah, Break the Ice kind of touches on that feeling of uncertainty uh, that comes with taking a risk to pursue your dream, which in my case is music. And just uh, pretty much says sometimes it's better to dive in head first into the deep end and not look back. Was music something you knew you were destined to do right from a very young age? I always grew up uh, with guitars in the house and it was something that happened very gradually for me. And I just self-taught myself with the access to the internet, especially on the guitar side of things. And the songwriting thing, just really gradually, I guess, going out and listening to the great acts we have locally is what sort of where I find my passion for songwriting and performing. What about uh, the music scene locally here in Belfast? Have we got a good thriving scene at the moment? I'd say so and there's definitely something for absolutely everyone in such a small densely populated city you know. Um, you've got your blues, pop and absolutely everything is here under the sun um, which is good and there's opportunities for everyone. Okay tell us about uh, the other song that you performed there as well what's the story behind that? Yeah so that is another track of the EP called Ain't Going Down Easily um, now, what they're about, I often find myself asking the same question, but I've come to the conclusion they're all sort of messages instead of a story or an experience. Um, 
that track in particular is just uh, touches on resilience. Uh, you know, when you're knocked down, just to pick yourself back up and keep pushing on. And if people want to follow you, find out more about you, how can they do that? Yeah, so Ben Cutler Music on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and then obviously all the music's coming out uh, 20th October on all streaming platforms. Okay, we're talking movies next with uh, movie maestro Tim Burden. But uh, tell me this, have you seen the new Kenneth Branagh Hercule Poirot movie? It's out now. It's called A Haunting in Venice. Here's a clip from the film. Somebody is dead. No one shall leave this place until I know who did it. A ghost killed her. There must be a rational answer for all of this. Just admit that you are up against something bigger than you. No! And we're going to chat about the new Poirot movie and lots more with Tim Burden right after these. Let the good times roll at Super Strikes at the Jet Centre. You can now book your lane online. We've got 14 bowling lanes and four mini bowling lanes. Plus we serve delicious hot food and snacks or enjoy a cold beverage with your food after the game. Discover bowling today at the Jet Centre. Jet Centre, entertainment for everyone. And welcome back to the final part of this week's Robin Elliott tonight. We are talking movies now with uh, the movie maestro Tim Burden. And I believe we can go live to a cinema somewhere in Belfast. Can you believe this? Tim Burden has actually got his own cinema for this part of the show. Tim, how are you? Robin, how are you doing? Good to see you. Well, uh, look, I thought it'd be nice and immersive, you know, for us all. But uh, big thanks to the wonderful Queen's Film Theatre in Belfast who've uh, who managed to squeeze me into this corner privately. It's, it's nice having a private cinema here. Um, their, their plush new seats are looking as great as ever. So, yeah, we have some very exciting things coming up, not just at QFT, as of course there always is, but we have um, at Cinemas Everywhere, the big release at the minute is our very own countryman, Sir Kenneth Branagh's A Haunting in Venice. Now, this is the third of the Kenneth Branagh Hercule Poirot movies, isn't it? That's right, perfecting his little Belgian accent. And we have to make sure it's not French, it's Belgian. Poirot gets very upset being called French, as you may, you probably remember. So this is based on Agatha Christie's A, um, a, haunt, a Halloween Haunting. Uh, that was the original story. Um, but this now called A Haunting in Venice. So, you know, we're in the location already of Venice, as much as it's beautiful. It also has this kind of strange, eerie atmosphere, especially at night, which, of course, a lot of this film is is shot. But basically, the premise centers around uh, Praro trying to get his head around the fact that perhaps there are ghosts, because he doesn't really believe in the occult or anything mysterious like that. Um, but his, uh, his beliefs are being tested because it seems to be there are some ghostly things going on. And what I love about this as well, he's, he's brought Jude Hill, who we all remember from Belfast. Yeah. Little Jude Hill is with him in this, and Jamie Dornan also with him. We've got Michelle Yeoh, who's just a wonderful actress. And, you know, Michelle Yeoh, I must tell you this story. This is, I've said this before, but uh, hopefully no one listening or watching has heard this. So Michelle Yeoh came to visit Northern Ireland. She was filming about, must be about 10 years ago. And I had this privilege, I was working in a hotel at the time, and I had the privilege to take her for a little tour around the, the North Coast. And she was so charming. She really was, I mean, very quiet, very shy, but she seemed genuinely kind of awestruck by the, the beauty, you know, the untouched beauty and rustic uh, visuals of, uh, you know, our beautiful countryside here in Northern Ireland. So, it was really lovely, and that's a kind of special memory. But Michelle Yeoh in this film is the kind of key protagonist, and it's it's also it's made for IMAX. So if, if you want to experience it like that, then uh, that's the opportunity to do that as well. But it's it, I think it's going to be a good film. You know, uh, Praro and Kenneth Branagh's reimagining of, of the character as being successful so far. So I'm sure this won't disappoint. 
And for anybody who's seen Murder on the Orient Express and uh, Death on the Nile, they will know just how stunning the scenery is in those movies and how great the cinematography is. Yeah, he has real visual flair. And we're going to look forward to yeah a lot a lot of attractive uh, visuals in this, especially you know around Venice. The kind of uh, re-releases I should highlight coming up. Halloween isn't that far away, believe it or not. The Exorcist is being re-released. In addition to, of course, this remake of The Exorcist, which I'm very much on the fence about, but sure, we'll uh, let's remain optimistic. <laughs> the Exorcist is also <laughs> going to be showing at Balamina's Braid. Art Centre, uh, which should be fantastic. The Exorcist at the end of September. And that's going to be very exciting to see it in the braid with uh, the Fright Club team. And there's also going to be a re-release of Christine. Believe it or not, it's 40 years old. So um, that's uh, that's going to be that's going to be re-released in selected cinemas. Um, so it's something to look forward to. Let's talk uh, sci-fi now. Tell us about The Creator. So this is Gareth Edwards' new film. And visually, this is going to be quite quite spectacular. So the story very much focuses on the AI aspects and the, very topical too. But it's, it's quite an apocalyptic film. It's set in the future. There's more AI than ever. So, you know, you, you've got these children and humans who are part robot, part human. And there's this kind of almost Vietnamese war atmosphere to the film and the, the clips i've seen uh, are very very impressive you know visceral images of war but then there's this kind of undercurrent of of psychological drama as well as this kind of science fiction aspects that uh, you know i think we're we're going to leave the cinema very much with the thoughts of you know could this happen is this what is to come so it's quite topical and the creator is going to be another very, very, um, I suppose, when you think of the the dynamic uh, Oppenheimer from a, a few week, months ago, I, I think this, again, is going to be something quite spectacular this year for, for science fiction visuals, you know. Now, we're going to take uh, you way back in time now and uh, talk about a movie that is absolutely timeless. In fact, I think it's as popular now as it was way back then. We're talking about the John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara classic, The Quiet Man. And there's something very special happening soon that you're involved in, isn't there? Yes, thank you. Myself and Frank Gallagher, I must give Frank Gallagher a big plug because the the name of the, the show is very much his baby. And it's a great title, From the Quiet Man to the Quiet Girl. And this is the, the recent Quiet Girl, was a massive success last year for Irish cinema. Beautiful film. And really, it's, uh, it's it's taking guests on a on a journey. We're going to be at the Strand Cinema on Thursday, the twenty sixth of October, from seven thirty. And Hugh Oddly Smee from BFI and the Film Hub, he's going to be hosting, and we're going to have live musicians, live composers, who will be really collectively taking us on this journey from the Quiet Man, you know, the Hollywood classic set, and with an Irish theme, all the way through the decades. You know, we'll have. Certainly Barry Lyndon will have Harry's Game. There'll also be TV as well as some film. We'll have the likes of Titanic, Far and Away. Whether you don't like the accents, it's a great film. <laughs> um, you know, and obviously Belfast. We'll have a bit of Belfast, Good Vibrations. One of your favourite films, I know. Yes. It's going to feature the lovely uh, Michelle Baird. She'll be singing um, from, you know, from the Irish Man, the Isle of Inish Free, from the, the Quiet Man. And then we're going to have also uh, Daryl Simpson from the Celtic Tenors. He's going to be singing the songs from Barry Lyndon. And then Mark Gordon from Score Draw Music is going to be performing with his Score Draw team a wonderful montage of some of the Irish film music and TV music of today. So Sarah Lynch's award winning The Dry, it's a great Kieran Hines show on ITV. Uh, she will be performing some of that. The brilliant Liam Neeson narrated documentary The Road about Joy Dunlop. There'll be a montage from that. Um, so it's going to be, yeah, a very special night. Uh, I hope people can join us. Part of the Belfast International Arts Festival. So I have to huge thanks to Richard Wakeley for embracing the project and also to uh, BFI and the Film Hub team for, for helping sponsor it and the Screen Compos 
Screen Composers Guild of Ireland, rather. So there, there's a lot of people to thank. But uh, the the basic premise is two hour a two hour event uh, in a cinema. We're going to play huge huge clips, you know, clips on the huge screen, and there'll be live music. So we'll be taking the audience on a journey through the the history of Irish cinema when it comes to music used in film. So what is it then that makes uh, The Quiet Man so special? Is it because it was kind of the first time that Hollywood came to Ireland? I think, yes, certainly there's some of that. I mean, it's just, it's the charm. It is the charm. A lot of people today, perhaps cynically, would think it's maybe a bit too twee and fiddly D, but it has its place. I mean, that that's, that's you know, its place in history. There's This Quiet Man has a charm, and obviously with John Ford's directing and his eye for detail this the colors are just beautiful it's such a green film i mean i know it sounds uh, a cliche saying that but it, the way it was shot in that glorious technicolor it, it just lights up the screen so and yeah the, the music you know we have the called the rakes of morrow of course the the classic kind of traditional irish music in there but there was also the, the wonderful brand new victor young score you know and uh, which yes did hark back to some traditional elements but it was a you know a full orchestral original score so there'll be certainly clips of that in the film and steven spielberg is a huge fan of john ford you know very inspirational to him as a director and there's that lovely scene do you remember in et whenever elliot has his first kiss yeah there's this wonderful little tribute to the quiet man which et is watching uh while he's trying to you know fix this little remote to try and you know get back home to his spaceship so it's it's something which uh, we're definitely going to play that clip on the night because there's it's important to highlight the parallels and the influence Irish cinema uh, or film set in Ireland has had on uh, you know film today and and people who are still entertaining us by their craft now, I did do something very special on the 60th anniversary of uh, The Quiet Man. I was lucky enough to be one of the last people to interview the Hollywood legend Maureen O'Hara. We had a great time. We spent uh, the weekend with her in Ashford Castle, down in Kong, where The Quiet Man was shot. I spent some time in the actual bedroom of the hotel that she stayed in when she filmed the movie and we had a great chat about working with John Wayne and John Ford and some of the other leading men that she worked with over the years, people like Burt Lancaster and even the late great John Candy as well. Incredible. And Ashford Castle, what a location. It's, uh, you know, as, as you remember, because you were there, I mean, apart from that lovely bridge that takes you to the the castle if you you know go you go around their corridors and all these historic photos of the celebrities you know it's it's incredible isn't it and of course yes uh, maureen was there and john wayne and you have as well the uh, charlie chaplin and all of these hollywood giants and, and i think ashford castle from what i understand is still very popular with the hollywood elite so your special event is taking place on the 26th of October in the Strand Cinema, which is a great venue. And for anybody who hasn't been, they really should go. It's one of the, the last great art deco cinemas out there, isn't it? It is. And it's going to be very elaborately um, renovated early, later this year, early next year. So it's going to be wonderful uh, to have that investment uh, to give it a bit of uh, uh, a bit of love and TLC. So that's, yes, do come. 26th of October. It's going to be a very special night. Well, Tim, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us on the show this evening. You too, Robin. Take care. All the best. So there we go. That's all we have time for on uh, Robin Elliott tonight this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all of my guests as well. And we'll see you back here same time next week. Bye-bye. Welcome to Movie House Cinemas. Popcorn? Yes, please. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the movie. Reclining chairs? Don't mind if I do. Action, thriller, romance, we got it all. Discover the cinema today. Movie House Cinemas, home of the movies.